So welcome to this third seminar on in our lunch seminar series called Environmental and Climate Humanities Seminar. You're most welcome here in the room and those of you who are online. And today we have a special guest from University of Helsinki, Hanu Pikkala, and you will talk about clim climate emotions and we really look forward to hear more from you. And uh, the... Pano will talk for 30 minutes and then we will have open the space for discussions and questions. So please, Pano, welcome. Thank you. Terveisiä Helsingistä. Mukava nähdä. Nice to see you all, both in Uppsala and online. Been visiting Uppsala a couple of times and I really like the city, but this time it's going to be on online. So the process and variety of climate emotions is my title. I do interdisciplinary environmental research. I have a background in studying religion and ecology. Some observations about that here, but mostly interdisciplinary research. But I'm going to start with a couple of paintings, a nod to the Norwegians. This is one yeah. painting of how it may feel to live amidst the climate crisis, but also this one might give instances of that. So there may be complex combinations of perhaps feeling some kind of calm and peace and joy amidst feelings of absurdity and confusion because of how the weather and climate is changing. I'll start with some questions for self-reflection. This is an introduction to what I'm going to talk about in relation to the process and the process model. If you look back, what kind of stages or phases in your own history have there been in terms of facing the environmental crisis? Do you remember a perhaps even a single moment when you first became more aware of the environmental crisis? Or have there been several of these kinds of moments, perhaps leading further into realizing how extensive the environmental problems are? Were there significant events in your life which had an impact here? Were some people or creatures or places influential for your story in this regard? What kind of feelings or emotions have been associated with these kinds of things and happenings? Or what kind of things have helped you to cope and change in different phases of your life journey in relation to facing the environmental crisis? Now, this is something which preferably would be done in a much longer session with both self-reflection and discussion about it. But I want, wanted to introduce the, this here. One framework for doing this kind of work is timeline of environmental identity. The environmental psychologist Thomas Doherty, for example, has been working with this method. There are some introductory videos by, by him about environmental psychology on YouTube, and this is one example of that. And this uh, exercise of timeline of environmental identity and life parts is sometimes used in environmental education, and I find it very useful also in relation to so-called ecological emotions. If you want to uh, hear more about conversations between me and Thomas and guests, this is our podcast, provocatively titled Climate Change and Happiness, sort of wanting to engage with, for example, the North American discourses of happiness. Fundamentally, it's about living a good or meaningful life amidst the changing circumstances. So this links with quite ancient philosophical topics of uh, meaning on, in life and, and happiness. Uh, but every two weeks, there's an episode coming out and you can find this on the usual podcast platforms like Spotify and Apple and, and so, so on. 
Also, to start with, I want to mention a couple of events so that I don't forget to do it. Uh, in Helsinki in June, we have a conference for eco-critical studies, especially in Scandinavia, but also internationally. And this year, the special theme is environmental emotions, uh, so both in texts and in visuals and movies and so on. The call for papers has just ended. We're going to have a very interesting set of pa papers and keynotes. So warmly welcome to Helsinki or to listen online in June, if you so wish. Another one that I want to mention is this conference in California, Environment, Justice and Politics of Emotion. Uh, it's two days and the first day is on-site only, but the second day is online. And I'll also be presenting on the second day together with, for example, Kirsti Jylhä and Julia Mosquera, who have been doing lots of climate emotion research in, in Sweden. So this is one of the first symposia to really concentrate on uh, politics of emotion in the environmental context. So I'm very excited about this. And over the years, I've greatly appreciated also Swedish research on this, for example, uh, studies by Maria Oyala, who seems to be present here today. Welcome, Maria. Nice to see you here around. What I mean by eco-anxiety uh, is that it's a broad phenomenon. We can either use the term uh, as an overall term for some kind of difficult feelings and mental states, which are significantly shaped by the ecological crisis and the various disciplines which have touched upon this theme are reviewed in this 2020 article, which I men mentioned here. For a more philosophical and emotion research take on these matters, together with philosopher Charlie Kurtz, we published a paper last year called Ego Anxiety, what it is and why it matters. Kurt has written a monograph called The Anxious Mind, uh, presenting a so-called biocognitive uh, view of anxiety and discussing the various forms which may be included under the word anxiety. To keep it simple, I just mentioned that it can manifest in difficult uh, states and anxiety states is what, for example, comes to mind often for psychiatric professionals when talking about this issue. But more broadly, anxiety as an emotion uh, arises when we encounter some kind of problematic uncertainty. And then usually what happens is that we try to find more information and adjust our behavior uh, to some direction. And then there, of course, can be many directions that we then start, start to go. And what we call practical eco anxiety is this adaptive and also ethical moral reaction of noticing the very real ecological crisis and then trying to react to it constructively. But then lots of things can happen and it can become more of a problem also. And currently, uh, most of the research in environmental psychology focuses on the problematic forms of eco anxiety or climate change related anxiety, which can be called climate anxiety. So in my uh, research, I'm doing a distinction between these two terms. I use eco anxiety or ecological anxiety or eco distress as the overall term. It can include also uh, anxiety and other difficult feelings, for example, in relation to biodiversity loss. Uh, and then uh, climate anxiety is the climate change related part of eco anxiety, even though the borders can be sometimes quite blurred between these two. But that much for anxiety at this phase for the broader range of climate emotions, which now means emotions, feelings, affect and moods, which are significantly uh, related to climate crisis. So for the broad array of them, there is this article from last year called Toward a Taxonomy of Climate Emotions, and the term emotion is used here in the broad sense. So this is sort of review and exploration of many kinds of affective and dimensions which can be present. And this could lead into quite complicated discussions, what we mean with the different terms like emotion, feeling and affect. And the practical aim in this paper is to uh, explore the various shades, uh, colors, if you so wish to use a me metaphor, and then there's lots of room for further discussions.
this is one example of a table I have in the in the article. So there's uh, pinpointing some sources where there is discussion about these emotions or mental states or feelings in relation to climate change. And also whether they have been included in Landman's uh, quite uh, in interesting work from 2020, one possibility for a taxonomy. I could easily spend the whole half an hour just talking about th this paper, but now I'll only make a couple of observations. One of them is that what is commonly called climate grief can, of course, include many kinds of affective tones from more mood like sadness to solastalgia, this neologism by environmental philosopher Glenn Albrecht, which means lo longing and sadness because of the home environment uh, is changing or has been changed so dramatically. So that can be related to many kinds of changes in, in, in one's, one's in environment. And then there's, of course, also, for example, yearning and longing. So not just acute and strong grief, even though that may also exist but various other connotations also. This figure brings out some of the emotional tones, not all of them. Uh, there is often confusion and sometimes that is made worse by actions in the social and political spheres. There's ethical aspects in that also. There is desire to do something, which is also a good example of an Phenomena which has clearly affective dimensions, but is not easy to name in all languages. So sometimes some of these emotional tones can remain a bit in the shade because some languages don't have specific terms for them. And this points to the need for also intercultural and, and cooperation between various la languages in this regard. Anxiety, fear, and worry are all related to threats of various kinds. And here I would ref refer to much research by Maria Oyala, for example, about various forms that these can, these can take. Sadness, guilt, and also shame. There's a growing research interest in environmental guilt and shame also. And those are very influential emotions also in the political sphere. Um, I'm thinking, for example, by of Tim Jensen's book, Ecologies of Guilt in Environmental Rhetorics, uh, which is very interesting analysis of many social and political discourses around so-called ecological guilt. And uh, in also in many forms, ranging from moral outrage to pure rage, and there can be many connotations here also, as in despair or feelings of hopelessness, feelings of helplessness and powerlessness, which are quite prominent in surveys, for example. But then there is also possibility for many kinds of empowering emotions and so-called positive emotions. I'm trying to avoid the simple distinction between negative and positive emotions, because that's a whole another topic for how different val values and normative presuppositions can be embedded in what we call negative and positive. But anyway, there can be feelings of togetherness, joy, sense of community, meaningfulness, often when people try to do something for the good uh, of the planet and themselves. So this is just a brief glimpse of some of the many possible emotional tones. Some observations, each emotion and feeling may manifest in various ways and contextual dynamics and intersectional justice issues always need consideration. And this is a major point in the forthcoming Riverside conference in, in April. For example, Sometimes disappointment and disgust may be natural and moral emotions in relation to the climate crisis. One area which would need more attention, I think, is positive emotional approach methods in relation to climate emotions and coping. And this is something it hasn't been done so much in societies and communities, but many people are now working in relation to this. So trying, <clears throat> excuse me, trying to develop ways 
to engage with various emotions constructively. It may be writing about various emotions. It may be a discussion-based workshop on discussing sadness in relation to climate change. So there's many possibilities for constructive work with various difficult emotions. And that's something I think which should be more explored and studied. In Finland, we do have a national project on ego anxiety in social and health sectors. This is the website for the project. There is an English summary now for it at the EU related website. Support for distress associated with ecological changes. So the title is a bit misleading. It's not just about climate change, but also about other ecological problems. And there's been interesting cooperation between various organizations in this, this project. For religion and pastoral care, I'm mentioning this paper also from last year and discussing the challenges of ego anxiety, broadly speaking, for pastoral care. And this team number, edited by Pamela McCarroll and Hiran Kim Crack, sorry for the pronunciation, includes also many other papers on the topic. <clears throat> but now I move on to discuss for the latter part of my presentation, this process model of ego anxiety and ecological grief. <clears throat> so this is one finger coming out of this quite long research article, which is found freely online. The point here is that we can think of the general process, which includes all both elements of anxiety, broadly speaking, and elements of grief. And we can think of more particular fe phenomena. Sorry for just a moment. And examples of some of these more particular phenomena have been named in these smaller circles around the center. They may be, for example, anxiety related to a projected major heat wave. This happens also in Northern Europe, but much more prominently in some parts of the world. There may be anxiety and grief arising from changing seasons or for example, stronger anxiety because of the publication of a new climate science report. A, the loss of a dear creature may be even a traumatic loss, and then theories of grief and bereavement and trauma may be helpful in investigating that. And there may be also longer term changes in local ecosystems, which cause sadness. So just some examples of what kind of phenomena can be present and the relations between local and global can be quite complex here, I think. But what I'm after in this process model is this general process of trying to encounter the ecological state of the world. And this then is the visual of the model. And don't worry if you can't see everything here, that's not necessary. From left to right, there's sort of chronological uh, uh, se sequence. And then there's thematic aspects in the middle is a sort of heart of the model called coping and changing. And then in the right is a sort of the de desired direction it's called living with the ecological crisis, almost the same formulation as in a very interesting recent method for group based work with climate emotions developed by Rosemary Randall, Rebecca Nestor and colleagues in Great Britain. So if you check out the website living with the climate crisis, you'll find very interesting material which was just released. So what is going on here is that in the left, there's unknowing, I mean, real unknowing about the ecological crisis. Earlier on, this period might have been longer in the contemporary world. Uh, even children in daycare sometimes some can start to hear about um, what's going on in ecosystems. Often a more 
complete knowing comes only later, but just to point out that the period of actual unknowing can be quite short these days. Then follows a very complex phase of semi-consciousness, which many uh, researchers from various fields have tried to investigate. People partly know and partly don't know, and there may be very complex psychological and social dynamics where people may also try not to know more because they have an instinct that if they accept the knowledge more, they will end up in challenges either psychologically or uh, in intersocial relations. But then if people reach some kind of awakening or realization, various things can happen. There can be sort of uh, attempts to repress or suppress the awakening and go back into semi-consciousness and disavowal. Or there can be various forms of uh, shock, sometimes even, even trauma, and these become mediating factors for the heart of the model, which is called coping and changing. So bringing together many different kinds of uh, research, it's pointed out here that it seems that for healthy adjustment and transformation, three dimensions are needed. Be, uh, some kind of action is needed. And of course, this model doesn't discuss uh, the, all the practical details related to action. It's clear that some forms of, uh, of action are both better for the planet and some forms of action are in contextually more available for people and so on. Then there's a need for what is here called grieving, uh, encountering difficult emotions related to changes and loss and then need for distancing. And it includes both self-care and avoidance. And this all is uh, then circled by uh, the possibility for strong anxiety and de depression of various kinds. One could also write burnout there. And a sort of visual dynamic idea is that if you go too far in any one, just one of these dimensions, the potential for stronger anxiety, depression, burnout, and so on gets stronger. So if you only do action, which may bring many results, but that also brings the potential of so-called climate burnout. If you only uh, walk in the area of grieving and you don't get any relief, from self-care, uh, you don't get rest from the grief process. If, if you don't get possibilities to do something about the problems, which brings feelings of efficacy and often also social company, then there's more danger of so-called complicated grief and, and this uh, area of stronger anxiety and depression. And finally, uh, distancing up to a certain point uh, is necessary so that people can still function. But if you only do distancing, then you end up usually in strong cognitive dissonance. And there's also often social trouble. For example, it's hard to have a widely respected role in contemporary societies if you completely distance yourself from the ecological crisis and so on. So, so in a tricky way, there's possibilities for stronger anxiety and depression also if you only do distancing. So for various people, the needs may be partly different, but it seems uh, that we all need elements from all these three categories for healthy adjustment and transformation, which is also an ethical process. Uh, one of the people who have written very insightfully about this is the Australian environmental education philosopher Blanche Verley, her book, Living with the uh, the climate, climate crisis, I think, is the, is the title, is freely available online. And she links also the challenges of uh, the, the colonial values and the patriarchal values into the challenges for adjustment and transformation. So here is the three dimensions, a very simple graph about them. And the idea is that if, uh, with the help of others and and many factors, we manage more to adjust and transform. This may be also analyzed from the point of view of theories of grief and bereavement. Then some of the titles get switched. 
Uh, also other emotions than grief get more possibility for attention. So emotional engagement is now the main title and grieving is the subtitle. But of course, grief as a process includes also many kinds of emotions. And self-care can be then the more conscious uh, and there can, can be more awareness of its need and practices which people do. And then distancing is the sub subtitle. There may still be potential for depression and anxiety. There may still be mood changes and new information can sort of uh, engender new new flows in the process, so to speak. But also there can be some, uh, some progress in relation to tasks of change processes and grief processes. So this can be used to reflect on one's own journey, for example. That's something which I, of course, personally uh, recommend. And I've had many interesting conversations with various people then reflecting on the uh, model. When using the model with various people, there is possibilities for validating various things and explore various dynamics. No model can serve all people. It's meant to be useful, but of course, there's nuances which are not captured here. And various people may have different needs. For example, those who are very active in climate action, uh, in my experience, often uh, have found the dimension of distancing very, very, very interesting and important because in many organizations still there is not enough support for people so that they could also take breaks from action when needed. That's very human because there's so, so much to do all the time, but avoiding burnout is a very, very important task. Focusing on the three dimensions of coping and changing is one good way to, to use this and think about those dynamics in, in our, our lives. And then in the article, there's lots of discussion about various aspects of adjustment and transformation, including what we may mean with concepts like, such as meaning, acceptance, resilience or transformative resilience, and then also the framework of so-called post-traumatic growth, which I find very interesting in this regard also. So there's lots to th think about also in relation to that, and I didn't even try to include uh, all of that, that now here. One newsletter which is very interesting in relation to eco-emotions is Generation Dread by B Brit Ray, uh, who is a quite uh, visible commentator on related matters, especially in the Anglo-American world. Her book of the same title has also been published. There is a two-part two interview where I talk about some aspects of this process model also on that website. But this is what I wanted to bring to the common common ta table in this uh, lovely opportunity to talk a bit about these matters. Uh, for for comments, you are welcome to reach out to me also also straight. But luckily, we also have the, now the nice opportunity for for at least fifteen minutes of discussion about this. So so once more, thanks for the invitation and looking forward to the discussion. <laughs>